Okay, so let me remind you where we got to last time. We were talking about the section on linear maps, also called linear operators. And we discussed uh, various equivalent conditions for a linear map between norm spaces to be continuous. So continuous, of course, you could define in the metric space sense with sequences converging to a point, or you can do it with epsilon and delta. Either way, because we're dealing with metric spaces. Um, but the condition C that we were equivalent to was this boundedness condition, which was equivalent to being bounded on the closed unit ball, which, which is what I gave you as C prime. So that meant that your linear map was bounded on the closed unit ball Equivalently, this means that your linear map takes bounded sets to bounded sets, and that's why such linear maps are known as bounded linear maps. We discussed the fact that the image of a linear map, since it's a subspace of the codomain, is not usually actually a bounded set overall, uh, unless it's a trivial linear map, which is constantly zero. Shall we, uh, we've got a problem with the sun getting in, is that right? Okay, let me see if I can fix that. I'll just pause the recording. Pause the recording while we try and stop the sun getting in. So, we'll try again. And uh, now we've got a slightly improved sunlight situation. So then we looked at the set of all linear maps between E and F, where E and F were norm spaces. Actually, when you're dealing with just linear maps, they could just be vector spaces, of course. It's only once you ask for them to be continuous that you want them to be norm spaces. So then we have B of E, F, the continuous linear map. Okay. And we have linear maps from the space to itself, or the continuous linear maps from the space to itself, which we had various abbreviations for. Then finally, we looked at the special case where you're mapping into a one dimensional space, and we talked about the linear functionals. Functionals meant that the, uh, you were mapping into a one dimensional vector space. In fact, specifically, you were mapping into the scalars and you put the usual norm on, on that. So the usual norm being just the modulus on the scalars. And then, so you've got the algebraic dual and the topological dual, which is more important, the continuous linear functionals. And we'll have a look at that because you can do a lot of things by duality in functional analysis. And so it's important to know what is the dual space of your spaces. We looked at... Uh, Adding linear maps, which is a point-wise definition. So you add them at each point. S plus T of X is S of X plus T of X. And the same for multiplying a linear map by scalar. And that made um, your set of linear maps into a vector space with the zero linear map as the zero element. And then we had a look and checked that the continuous linear maps were a subspace of that. Of course, note that the, I didn't mention it, uh, or at least I didn't write it down, that the zero linear map is, of course, going to be continuous whenever it can be. So, uh, so you're not going to have an empty set when you're looking at the continuous linear maps. You will have the zero linear map, and then you have to check addition and scalar multiplication, which we looked at last time. Um, And essentially what you saw here is that if you've got a constant working for S and another constant working for T, you could add those constants and get a constant that works for the operator S plus T, which we'll come back to and use again in a minute. And again, if you found a constant that works for the operator S, then you can multiply that constant by mod alpha to get a constant that works for alpha S. And alpha S will also be a continuous linear map between E and F. And I didn't say it last time, but uh, the zero linear map is available. So, so that shows that you've got this linear subspace. Then in particular, if, if you take 
capital F to be the scalars, then what you get is that the continuous linear functionals form a linear subspace of the linear functionals. So again, the set of continuous linear functionals is a nice vector space. But what we really want is to put a norm on these things when we can. So this is what we just said. The continuous linear maps, B of EF, is a linear subspace of all linear maps, from E to F. Um, so that means that the topological dual is a linear subspace of the algebraic dual, because the algebraic dual is just the set of all linear maps from E into the scalars. And the topological dual, E star, that was defined to be this, the continuous linear maps from E into the scalars. Right. So if I just say dual, I'm going to mean the topological dual because the algebraic dual is not usually very important. So what I want to do now is to think about what I call the operator norm, which I'll denote by norm sub op. If you've got a continuous linear map between norm spaces, we can define what's called its operator norm. Now, it's not obvious yet what this means. And what I'm going to do is give you a bit of explanation in a minute as to what, what this is for. But let's have a, just a quick look at the definition and check that it makes sense. Remember I said that if you're continuous, then you're going to be bounded on the closed unit ball. What this is, it says, what is that bound? So x is allowed to go through the closed unit ball of E. So this norm x, which of course is norm x sub E, that means that x is in the closed unit ball in E. So it's B sub E of 0, 1. So you look at all x in the closed unit ball, you apply T to it, and you get some elements in F, and as we said, that should be bounded. And that bound gives you this, uh, you get this constant C. And this is the best constant C that works. So it turns out that amongst all the constants you can find that satisfy those conditions mentioned before, this is the best one. So this is... Uh, the best, meaning the least, constant, you call it C sub T, um, from above. The best constant that works for T. Continuously in functionals, you do something very similar. So what's going on here? Well, Remember, if you're a continuous linear functional, so E star means you're a continuous linear functional, this is phi is a continuous linear map from E going into the scalars. And on the scalars, the norm you want is modulus. So mod phi of x is the norm of phi of x in the scalars. So this is exactly the same as above, and that's what you get when you take the operator norm of a continuous linear functional. It's exactly the same scheme as above. Any, any questions on that so far? I'm going to say a few more things about it. But so far, it's just a definition It says here, exercise proves the operator norm really is a norm on BEF. Now, I'm going to do some of that for you. But before I do that, I want to explain the connection with Lipschitz continuity. So what's all this about Lipschitz continuity? Lipschitz continuity, you may recall, is something defined for maps between metric spaces. So let x dx 
and y dy be metric spaces, Then, in our terminology, this comes from metric and topological spaces. It's not entirely standard. A function, f from x goes to y, is Lipschitz continuous. with constant a greater or equal to naught and there's always, there's always going to be infinitely many different choices of constant once you found one if for all x1 and x2 in x we have The distance in y between the images, f of x1 and f of x2, is less than or equal to this constant a times the distance in x between x1 and x2. Okay, so once you've found a constant A that works, any bigger constant will do as well. But there is always a best one, where you take the infimum of all the possible A's, and then it turns out to be a minimum A, and it works. Um, because it's less than or equals, there is, in fact, always a minimum constant that works. But any constant bigger than that also works. Notice what's going on. This is saying that the distance apart of the images is less than or equal to some constant times the distance apart of the originals. And in metric and topological spaces, you'll come across quite a lot of examples of functions that were or weren't Lipschitz continuous. And Lipschitz continuous is better than uniform continuity, which is better than continuity, and so on. So you may want to go back and have a look at some of those stuff from metric and topological spaces. Now, as I say, um, if the constant A works, so does any larger constant. But as I've said, but there is always a minimum. A minimum A which does work if F is Lipschitz continuous. Of course. Okay, so let's go back to the norm space setting. If T is a bounded, that's another word, continuous, linear map from a norm space E norm E to F norm F, we know there exists some C greater than zero I'll say greater or equal to zero, that is just as good. With uh, norm T x in F less or equal to C times norm x E for all x in E.
Well, this looks a bit like Lipschitz continuity, except that there's only one element, x. So what happens if you have two elements, x? That two elements of E. Now let's let x1 and x2 be in E. And you want to know how far apart are Tx1 and Tx2. Well, you can rewrite that. That's equal to the norm of T of x1 minus x2 in F. Because T is linear. But now that's for the same constant C as above. That's going to be smaller to C times the norm of x1 minus x2 in E. That's C as above. And these are the distances. That's the distance between the images Tx1 and Tx2. This is the difference between x1 and x2 and e. So, t is Lipschitz continuous with constant c. So that c that came up in the definition of continuity is actually a Lipschitz constant for this um, what in full you call a Lipschitz condition of order one, but which I'm uh, making, uh, that's a, a rather long name for something that's an easy concept. That's why I call it Lipschitz continuity for short. Okay, then I said, we looked at this um, operator norm. That's the supremum of the norm of Tx in F, where x is in E and norm x is less than or equal to 1 in E. Now, first thing is that we can see that for any, of the, any such constant C that we've got above, this is going to be less than or equal to C for any constant C that works as above. Because we know that the norm of Txf is less than or equal to C times the norm X in E. Okay, and if the norm X in E is less than or equal to 1, then this is going to be at most C. So this is smaller or equal to C whenever C is a constant as above. And as I say, it actually turns out that this is also such a constant, and this is the minimum constant. So this is the best possible, the least possible Lipschitz constant for T. So it's the best possible... least Lipschitz constant. For T. A few little details there for you to check. But uh, so hopefully now I've clarified some of the connections here. So, so remember, just as norms are equivalent if and only if they were uniformly equivalent, if and only if they were Lipschitz equivalent, so linear maps are continuous between norm spaces if and only if they're Lipschitz continuous. 
So it does show you there's something very special about norm spaces and linear maps. They're very different from the general setting of metric spaces and any of continuous functions. You get a lot of information for free. Now, the claim is that the operator norm is a norm. But this, rather than proving this all again, let me go back and show you some of the calculations we did. Remember how we showed that a sum of two continuous linear maps is continuous? We chose a constant for S and a constant for T. And we are free to choose those to be the best possible constants, in which case they, these might as well be the operator norms. And the following argument still works. Then, so if you say that that's the operator norm of S, because we've chosen the best possible, and we choose the best possible one for t, so this is the operator norm of t. Then when you look here and ask what does s plus t of x do, well, we said you could add the constants and get a constant that works. But the operator norm is the best constant, the least constant. So if the sum of the operator norms works, then the operator norm of the sum must be less or equal to the sum of the operator norms. And of course, it can be strictly less than. So you just go back here and you go through substituting in the operator norm instead of the CSCT. And your conclusion here is that CS plus CT works for the sum. And if CS plus CT works for the sum, then it's a constant that works. But we know the least constant that works is the operator norm. So the operator norm of S plus T will be less than or equal to CS plus CT, or be less than or equal to the sum of the operator norms. And uh, this one here. Well, of course, you're supposed to get an equality with the operator norms, but it's not too surprising with scaling up and scaling down that when you multiply by a constant, exactly the right thing happens to your Lipschitz constant. So if you multiply your linear map by a constant, you scale everything, that scales distances by the, set, by the modulus of alpha. If you scale your distances by the modulus of alpha, you're going to scale your Lipschitz constant by exactly modulus of alpha as well. So I'm not going to go through and do all the details of the exercise because it would be repeating too much of what I did. But hopefully that will give you some idea how you'd fill in the details. And I'll leave it to you to finish the proof of that exercise, that the operator normally does give you a norm on the vector space of continuous linear map between E and F. So the very nice thing that's good, that turns out to happen for free, that we will see, uh, it turns out that even if E is incomplete, if F is a Banach space, this vector space of linear operators is a Banach space too. It's the second space that matters, not the first. The, uh, so the continuous linear operators from E to F is complete as long as F is. Um, and you don't care about E. Which is, I always find, a very surprising fact. And as a result of that, that if you start with a norm space and do the topological dual, that's the linear maps from your norm space, uh, sorry, the continuous linear maps from your norm space into the scalars. But the scalars are complete. So if you take a norm space and take its topological dual, it's always a Banach space, even if the space itself wasn't. And I think that... Uh, enough for section 3.3, but just to give you a chance to ask any questions you've got about that section. Otherwise, I'll pause the recording and we will move on to uh, section 3.4 on sequence spaces.